There have been shocking moments in the Trump presidency, many of them, so many that it's actually hard to count. But if there were some kind of accounting for all of the shocking moments in the Trump presidency, this one, if we have the video, would certainly be near the top of the list. Just now, President Putin denied having anything to do with the election interference in 2016. Every U.S. intelligence agency has concluded that Russia did. What, who, my first question for you, sir, is who do you believe? They think it's Russia. Uh, I have uh, President Putin. Uh, he just said it's not Russia. I will say this. I don't see any reason why it would be. I will tell you that President Putin was extremely strong and powerful in his denial today. The President of the United States of America, Donald Trump, standing alongside Russian President Vladimir Putin, aligning himself with Russian claims over U.S. intelligence and denying what everyone at that point knew to be true. Russia interfered in the 2016 election. Throughout his time in office, Trump denied and downplayed and excused Russian interference in America's elections. He called the investigation into that interference a hoax and a witch hunt over and over and over again. And now Mr. Trump is set to be on trial for his own efforts to overturn the 2020 election and his baseless claims that the election was stolen. And Trump's new defense in that case appears to be that the court should believe his claims about a stolen election, and the reason the court should believe the election was stolen is because of Russian interference. I am not joking. This is from Trump's lawyer's latest motion in the federal election case. Between January 2019 and at least December 2020, parties reportedly linked to Russia's Foreign Intelligence Service perpetrated what the SEC recently described as one of the worst cybersecurity incidents in history. On January 6, 2021, the U.S.'s cybersecurity agency deemed that this threat poses a grave risk to the federal government and state, local, tribal, and territorial governments. Just for a second, imagine being Trump's lawyer and going before the court to say with a straight face that your client, Donald Trump, was just really concerned about Russian election interference. And, and that it was Russia's fault and not Trump's that certain Americans distrusted the results of the 2020 election. Well, that argument is part of a pair of new motions from Trump's lawyers demanding that the American government turn over thousands of documents that the defense believes will help Trump prove his case in court. And the Russian interference stuff is just really the tip of the iceberg here. Trump's lawyers want the government to turn over everything they have on federal efforts to investigate fraud in the 2020 election. They want the government to turn over anything they have regarding undercover agents at the Capitol on January 6th. They're thereby promoting the baseless theory that the violence on January 6th may have resulted from a failed sting operation by the FBI. The defense also wants any documents or information supporting the baseless conspiracy that Joe Biden pressured Merrick Garland to indict Donald Trump. The defense wants to know if the Justice Department pressured former Vice President Mike Pence to change his testimony to prosecutors. The defense wants communications between the Justice Department and the Biden family, including Hunter Biden, who has absolutely nothing to do with this case except for the fact that Republicans apparently like saying his name a lot. It seems pretty obvious what Trump is trying to do here. Number one, bury this judge, Judge Chutkin, in paper in an attempt to delay this trial. Number two, relitigate the big lie and sow further mistrust in our democracy. And three, dig up as much dirt as possible during the discovery process and use it during the campaign season. But as Trump's lawyers proceed in that three-pronged effort, we are getting new evidence that Trump himself knew it was all a lie. New excerpts from Liz Cheney's forthcoming book reveal that just two days after the 2020 election, Republican leader Kevin McCarthy told Cheney that Trump knew he had lost the election. He knows it's over, McCarthy reportedly told Cheney. He needs to go through all the stages of grief. That same day, that same day, Kevin McCarthy went on Fox News and said this. And President Trump won this election, so everyone who's listening, do not be quiet. Do not be, do not be silent about this. We cannot allow this to happen before our very eyes. 
Donald Trump forced the Republican Party to go along with his election lies, even when he allegedly knew that he had lost the election. And now he is going to attempt that same strategy in a federal courtroom. Joining me now is Melissa Murray, a professor at NYU Law School and the co-host of the Strict Scrutiny podcast. Also with me is former Missouri senator and current MSNBC political analyst, the great Claire McCaskill. Um, first, Melissa, from a legal perspective, let me get your assessment of this request. It's 59 requests from the defense, 70 pages of legal motions, 300 pages of supporting exhibits asking for material that the prosecutors don't even necessarily have in their possession. So, as you said in the opening, Alex, uh, this is kind of a long shot for Donald Trump. I think, again, there are multiple strategies that are being pursued here. Um, the first, and I think principally, is to slow Judge Chutkin down by inundating her with paper. Um, as a general matter, defendants can ask for material that's relevant to their defense, but they can't really ask for the world. And in situations like this, it really comes down to whether or not the prosecution has withheld information that would be relevant to mounting a vigorous defense. And here, some of this seems a little bit far field. Certainly the materials on Hunter Biden that were requested do not seem relevant to the issues at play in the January 6th hearing. So delay seems to be the name of the game here, but he's also playing to another court, and that's the court of public opinion. And again, you are exactly right in that a lot of this is to, again, begin to sow the seeds of disinformation and the idea that the election was stolen in 2020 and that the 2024 election is similarly imperiled. Um, Claire, the thing that almost made my head explode was the notion that Donald Trump is deeply concerned about Russian election interference. I mean, it, it really <laughs> defies explanation would any is anybody out there to be convinced that joe biden was vladimir putin's pick for president in 2020 especially given the state of affairs between the two men now no um no one i is buying that except that group of people and it's somewhere around 20 to 25 percent of america that has decided to believe whatever he says he could say the most outlandish, outrageous, and has said the most outlandish and outrageous things, and they will believe it. But I got to tell you, looking at all these cases, and I love Melissa's take on this, you know, it makes me dizzy. We have civil cases. We have a civil cases that are in front of the D.C. Circuit and have been there for over a year after they were argued and have not been decided, that, that touch on issues that he's bringing up now. Then we have other civil cases against Trump. Then we have criminal cases against Trump, both at the federal level and the state level. And all of this is swirling. It makes me dizzy. And I'm a lawyer. It makes me dizzy. All of the cases that are out there, all of the motions that are being filed, and candidly, all the appeals that will be possible. So I would really like the respected judges that are on the bench on these cases, especially those in the appellate court, what could be their excuse for not deciding Donald Trump's appeal on the issue of immunity in civil trials? Why in the world would that, that circuit be taking a year to decide a case? It is way outside the norm. Yeah, I and mean, we actually spent quite a bit of time talking about that yesterday in the way that these kind of Pre-trial motions have, and beyond these appeals, have a way of potentially really slowing down the timetable, even for an aggressive judge like Judge Chutkin, which sort of begs the question, Melissa. I mean, I assume there's a lot in this request from the defense that is laughable, but I would also assume that there's probably something in there that has some merit that could throw gum in the works, if you will. I mean, and, and it, do you have that sense? And and what might that be? What might be the implications of a, a sort of extended discovery process here? I think that's exactly right. Um, some of this is obviously going to be outlandish. Some of the material that's been requested, we don't even know if the Department of Justice has that in its possession. It could be part of the government's coffers of materials, but not necessarily things that are easily accessible to the prosecution and therefore able to be easily turned over to the defense. So a really good judge, a diligent judge, and Judge Chutkin is both a good and diligent judge, 
is going to have to sift through and separate the wheat from the chaff here. And that is going to be time consuming. And, you know, this is a case that was meant to be lean, mean, and to move expeditiously. And this will slow it down. We have the Mar-a-Lago case, which already seems to be slowed down because Judge Cannon doesn't seem to be moving in an expeditious fashion. We have the case down in Georgia, which is slow moving because it's so unwieldy with so many defendants. And then, of course, we have the hush money case, which was always perhaps uh, the most minimal in terms of the legal jeopardy that Donald Trump was in and also the nature of the charges themselves. But these are the two meatiest cases, and they're the ones that are more most likely to be slowed down by all of these lit litigation shenanigans.